It's a pleasure to be here with you this morning. We've looked forward to this opportunity to come and participate. We have come to love this congregation, appreciate the good work that it continues to do, and we appreciate the eldership for its continual promotion of this lectureship. And uh, uh, one of the things I told Brother uh, Maxie before uh, we started this morning is it's uh, uh, just a pleasure to see how the, the sleeves are rolled up by all the members uh, to be involved in all the carrying out of the activities that need to be done. And uh, you just don't have any want for anything as far as the uh, answering questions about where things are and what's going on because everybody seems to be plugged in and they know what's going on. That makes for a great lectureship and we appreciate it. We appreciate so much uh, having the opportunity to, uh, to be a p part of this. It's great to have had uh, a couple of our elders uh, Brother Jim Garner and Ray Cozart that have come out here and uh, be a part of the lectureship. I never know whether they're just coming to hear the lectures or they're just coming to make sure I get here. But uh, they're here and I appreciate that. I love them. We have great elders at, at Fayetteville and uh, they give me a lot of encouragement in the work uh, that I strive to do. Perhaps you've heard the story about the two little boys that <clears throat> were somewhat rambunctious and the parents of these kids were greatly concerned because it just seemed like they were into everything. And so they went to their preacher and they talked to the preacher about their concerns that uh, they just seemed to have lost control over these boys. And so they asked the preacher, would you, would you mind talking to these fellas? Well, the preacher thought about it a second. He said, well, I tell you what, let me just talk to one of them at a time. Just send, send your youngest son in and let him sit down with me for a little while and we'll see if we can... It maybe helped the situation somewhat. So the occasion took place. The little boy was brought into the office. And you imagine how nervous he was. And the preacher was sitting behind the desk. He comes in. He sits down in the chair. And so the preacher gets up. And he walks over in front of the child, or the little boy. And he places his hands on the two arms of the chairs. And he looks him straight in the eye. And he asks the question, Where is God? Of course, you can imagine the look on the little boy's eyes as he's looking up at this preacher in great fear. A few seconds probably seemed like hours to the little boy passed. And the preacher asked with stronger consternation, he said, Where is God? And the little boy, I mean, he just slipped out from under that chair and he ran out that door. In fact, he ran all the way home. And when he got into the house, he ran in the bedroom, slammed the door and got up under the bed. Well, his little brother, his other brother, was standing there watching the whole thing. He said, what happened? What happened? The little boy said, well, they've lost God and they're blaming us for it. <laughs> well, that's a cute little story and you've probably heard it before, but I think it says so much about what people have come to recognize or how people are when it comes to recognizing that God is really in the world and that God sees everything. Perhaps the preacher trying to get the young boy to see that God was watching everything that he did was lost on the child. But yet, it shows that we live in a world that by and large has forgotten God. They've forgotten the fact that God sees what's going on. That, they, that He sees their lives and He sees what's happening to our lives. I think for many people in the world, we've come to to see that people like to take God uh, and the things of God somewhat like going to a grocery store uh, where they go to the grocery store of the Bible and they get a little pound of marriage or maybe a bushel of Jesus or uh, a little package of God and, and they, they wrap it up and they put it in a bag and they take it home and they place it in, in their own little compartments and, and uh, they take it out from time to time and use it in whatever way that they want to use it and... Uh, and of course, we know that we can't live that way. And we know that we can't have effective lives. But our society's in trouble, folks. There are problems that we just simply don't have time to entertain the depth of. But yet when you consider the divorce rate and the abortion rate, homosexuality and the problems with pornography in the world, alcoholism and drug abuse, and the various problems with child molestation and rape and even tax evasion and, and the list goes on and on. We see a, a world that has forgotten that God is in it. Much less that he sees what's going on. That he sees them personally. 
There's something about knowing that God sees me in all of the various things that I do that, that challenges me concerning right action. The thought that he's looking over my shoulder or even that he is all seeing and that he is standing right in front of me challenges me to make good decisions about my life. Oh, that the world would see that there is an all-seeing God in the world. The face of God, the Bible teaches, is against all kinds of evil. In Psalm 34 and verse 16, the face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. I think that verse tells us that God is serious about doing the right thing. And God is serious about us living in the right way. And he recognizes that what is going on in the world is something that he is going to handle if we don't learn to handle ourselves that he's going to deal with if we don't learn to deal with ourselves and deal with our lives. Don't you remember the occasion in, when the, the men who were sent from God came to Lot and his wife and his family and encouraged them to get out of, uh, out of Sodom and encouraged them that they need to hurry because God had seen what was going on. In Genesis 19, the Bible tells us, for we will destroy this place. Because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. You see, what had happened is the God of heaven had seen all the sodomy of all the sodomites in Sodom from the very beginning. And he was tired of it. And the righteous indignation of God was strong to the point that he destroyed that place. We might ask the question... If we see a God that sees the world in the way that he sees the world 24-7, never misses a thing, and he has seen all the things that have gone on from the beginning of time, why is it that he keeps letting the world go on in the way that, that it does go on? And I think maybe that may be one of the reasons why people in the world simply have turned their backs on God because they really don't think that he's in the world. They have a, some a form of deism in their philosophy that says, you know, God made the world, but he's really not interested in what, what's going on in the world. He's not really caring about what you do or what I do. And, and you know, if you stop and think about it, maybe there's a little bit of all uh, that in all of us. Sometimes when we're carrying on day in and day out in life's challenges and life's battles, Sometimes we think, well, God's not really interested in what's going on in my life. He expects me to get out there and kind of take control. And that's when we start getting in trouble. We need to always remember that God is in control and that God is watching, that God cares. Have we forgotten so much the reason why God destroyed the world in the first place by water? If you have your Bibles, you might want to look back at Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5. And listen to what is said there in that passage. The Bible says, or Moses reports, he says that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of the heart was only evil continually. The Lord saw what was going on. Not only could he see what was going on, but he knew what they were thinking. And he knew they just kept thinking about bad things. I hear people say from time to time, well, do you think the world is bad enough now to where the Lord will destroy it? I don't think so. I just have my feeling that we still live in a world full of, of evil, but we have a world where there is good being done. And we have hope in the gospel of Jesus Christ that challenges and encourages and motivates and lifts up people who really care for doing what's right, just like yourselves. To do the will of God and put God first. But let's not get away from the fact that God sees everything. In fact, the passage of scripture that we're to consider this morning, Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 3, addresses this very issue. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. He sees what's going on. He's watching what's happen, happening. The psalmist said, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. 
His eyes behold, his eyelids test the sons of men. Or as one translation says that he sees what people do and he keeps his eyes on them. He's watching. You remember Nadab and Abihu and all the things that were going on in Leviticus chapter 10? That was an occasion where God was saying, I'm watching. Or when the church was established, and remember the occasion with Ananias and Sapphira when they, when they sold their property and, and brought it before the apostles and said, Here, here's all of it when they had held some back of it. God struck them dead for lying. The Bible says that there was great fear that came upon the church. You know why great fear came upon the church? Because they realize God's watching. He's seeing what's going on. I think there's a lot of misunderstandings concerning the all-seeing God that need to be looked at and need to be considered. Oh, we have a history of people that did not understand about the all-seeing God. Israelites, they didn't understand about the all-seeing God. They'd been in, in uh, captivity some 400 years. They'd been brought out of that captivity by Moses, brought to Mount Sinai. Moses goes up into the mountain to receive the law from the Lord. And while he is there, the children of Israel, they get a little antsy. They feel like, well, Moses has gone away and, and, you know, we need to worship here. So we need to have God. And so they ask Aaron, I want you, Aaron, would you go and, and, and make us or would you authorize us to make a God? Of course, they pressured Aaron, and Aaron said, sure, go ahead and make your, make your God. And, and he authorized what was going on. But you, know, you really know what was going on there. You see, these people had a perception that God was only present when you actually made him into something and brought him into your presence. See, they had the idea that if you fashion a calf and you bow down and worship that calf, then you've got God with you. But here's the, here's the kicker on this thing. What happens when you get through with worship? You take the calf and you go and you place it behind a curtain somewhere. And when the calf is behind the curtain, then the God can't see, and therefore you get on with your partying and your life, and you do what you want to do. But they didn't realize that there was an all-seeing God in that mountain who saw exactly what was going on, and he told Moses what was happening, and he said, get yourself down there and straighten out this problem. There are a lot of, I guess, a lot of passages of Scripture in, that remind us about how God sees everything. Turn your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 20. I wish we had time to really explore this whole discussion, but uh, this was an occasion where it was hundreds of years later in 1 Kings chapter 20 when Ben-Hadad, who was the Syrian king, had his sights on Israel. In fact, he had sent a letter down there to Oahab and, uh, and told him that he was going to uh, send a patrol down there and that he was going to collect all the gold and the silver and their women and their children. And Ahab said, well, and he talked to this, the uh, elders of the people and they said, no, nah, I don't know if we can do that kind of thing. The Bible says in chapter 20 and verse 1 that Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, gathered all his forces together. Thirty-two kings were with him with horses and chariots. And he went up and besieged Samaria and made war against it. Well, he's ready for, ready for a battle up in the hills, in the mountains. Well, in the long and short of it, as a result of what took place on this occasion, God sent a prophet to Ahab and, and told him, I'm going to strengthen you and I'm going to provide for you and you're going to overcome this day. In fact, a patrol was sent out. In fact, Ben-Hadad was in this patrol. And uh, they went down and tried to engage Ahab's army. And Ahab overtook Ben-Hadad and his men. Uh, in fact, Ben-Hadad just escaped just barely. Well, they get back home. And the servants of Ben-Hadad, this is what I really want you to see. The servants of Ben-Hadad come to him down in verse 23. And listen to what they say. I love these stories. Listen, he says, The servants of the king of Syria said to him, Their gods 
are gods of the hills. Therefore, they're stronger than we are. But if we fight against them in the plain, surely we'll be stronger than they. Or don't you love smart servants? You can just hear God, see God standing there listening to this, this wisdom, and saying, I'm going to show them. The Bible further tells us that in the spring, sure enough, Ben Hadad, he believes all this. He believes that the God's not everywhere all the time. He's up in the hills. Their God's a God of the hills, not a God of the, of the valley. And so he prepares all of his armies, and they're going to go down, and they're going to take Israel. Well, look at verse 28. Then the man of God came and spoke to the king of Israel, and he said, Thus says the Lord, because the Syrians had said, The Lord is God of the hills, but he is not God of the valleys. Therefore, I will deliver all this great multitude into your hand, and you shall know that I am the Lord. If you read further, that's exactly what happened. On that occasion, Ahab and his army killed above 100,000 soldiers in that army. But in verse 30, the Bible says 27,000 of them fled. They saw what was going on. They saw that it was a great destruction. And so they decided, we got to get out of here. And so they run to the city of Aphek thinking, we're going to get away from this God. And they go in and they hide. Now, I don't know how you hide 27,000 men behind a wall, but they go and hide behind a wall, and you can just about see them. They're all kind of hunching over, and they're looking around the corner to see, I think, I, I think we've hidden. I think we've gotten away. I think we may just make it right back to Syria. And all of a sudden, they look up, and this wall that they're standing beside starts falling over, and wham! 27,000 men die. You can't get away from God. He's there. Ben Hey Dad licked his wounds and went home. He knew you can't beat God at his own game. We have an all seeing God. That some people just seem to have a hard time recognizing that, that he is there and that he is watching. Turn your Bibles over to the book of Amos. Amos the prophet. Amos that preaching prophet. Boy, Amos seems to have a, a good perspective on what God sees. He's prophesying both to Judah and to Israel in the days just before Israel's departure to Assyria. And listen to some things that he says there beginning in verse 1. And I saw the Lord standing by the altar and said, Strike the doorposts that the thresholds may shake and break them on the heads of them all. I will slay the last of them with the sword. He who flees from them shall not get away. And he who escapes from them shall not be delivered. Now listen to verse 2. Though they dig into hell, that's Sheol, that's death, digging into the unseen world. Though they dig into hell, from there my hand shall take them. Though they climb up to heaven, from there I will bring them down. And though they hide themselves on the top of Carmel, from there I will search and take them. Though they hide from my side at the bottom of the sea, from there I will command the serpent and it shall bite them. Though they go into captivity before their enemies, from there I will command the sword and it shall slay them. I will set my eyes on them for harm and not for good. You want to hide away from God? You going to get away from God? You think it's possible to find a place where you might be able to get away from God? Not going to happen. In fact, in a very beautiful passage back in the book of Psalms, David presents the idea of warmth and comfort in knowing that God sees everything and is everywhere. In Psalm 139, 
don't have the time to read it all, but let me just read a few verses there in Psalm 139 to catch the beautiful spirit of it. He says in verse 7, Where can I go from your presence or from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. And if I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you. But the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. I guess if you're on the side of loving and appreciating what God does for you, it's a comforting thing to know that God sees everything that's going on. But if you're on the other side, it's not a good thing at all. Because you can't go far enough away from an all-seeing God. Jeremiah said it this way. Am I a God near at hand, says, says the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can anyone hide himself in secret places so I shall not see him, says the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord. Jeremiah 23, 23. And verse 24, Hosea said it this way concerning the king of Samaria and the nation of Israel at large. He says, as for Samaria, her king is cut off like the twig of the water. Also the high places of Av and the sin of Israel shall be destroyed. The thorn and thistle shall grow on their altars. They shall say to the mountains, cover us, and to the hills, fall on us. Hosea chapter 10 and verse 8. In fact, John captures this imagery in the production of the sixth seal in the book of Revelation. When he pronounces judgment on the kingdoms of the world, when the gospel is presented in its glorious form on that day, wonderful day of Pentecost when it was pronounced the first time. When he speaks of the kings of the earth and says, the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the commanders the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid, him, hid themselves in the caves and the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of the wrath has come. And who is able to stand? Revelation 6, verse 15 through 17. You can't hide from God. And the coming of the gospel presents that concept even more beautifully in the idea that the Lord has presented for us a gospel. Good news to the whole world. To the point that in Colossians chapter 1, this message had gone to everyone under heaven before the end of the first century. No one had an excuse you see, people on the day of judgment aren't going to say, are not going to be able to say, well, see, I never saw that you could see. I never understood that you could see everything that was going on. They're going to be without excuse to be able to proclaim innocence when they are so guilty for the sins that they have committed. Our God does never want us to forget that he sees everything. In fact, you'll be better off if you'll always remember that. The Israelites had problems remembering it even though God had proclaimed that he was going to. They had a 40-year reminder that God was in control. Did they not? 40-year reminder. They had 40 years to walk around in that desert and remember, you know, God's watching everything. He's taking care of us. He's watching. You'd have thought they'd have figured that out when they crossed over on dry land. But they're not a whole lot different than us. We have had some marvelous things happen in our life, have we not? And it's so easy for us to forget that he's really watching. 
that he's really caring, that he's taking care of us. In Deuteronomy chapter 11, Moses tried to comfort the children of Israel. And in speaking about this new land they were going to go into, he says, It's a land for which the Lord your God cares. The eyes of the Lord your God are always on it from the beginning of the year to the very end of the year. You see, the Israelites were hopefully going to take it that if God's eyes are on the land itself, then certainly God's eyes are going to be on us too. But did they remember that? Oh, no. In fact, you look at the book of Judges and you see time and time again, some seven times the Bible tells us that they did evil in the sight of the Lord. And twice, in chapter 17, and verse 6, in chapter 21, and verse 25, it says they did that which was right in their own eyes. You see, when you do things in your own eyes, you're not doing it through God's eyes. And in so doing, God's not pleased. There's a good case in point a few hundred years later in King Asa, the divided kingdom period of time. King Asa was on the throne in Judah. Basha was on the throne in Israel. And I mean, they fought like cats. They never could get along with each other. If you read 2 Corinthians, or 2 Chronicles chapter 15, you would see that Asa was such a good king when he came to the throne. He tore down the altars of Baal and he did such great things. He purified the, uh, the priesthood. He just did some wonderful things for the cause of God. But the Bible says he had rest about 10 years. Then after that time, he just started having conflict after conflict after conflict with Basha. In fact, just turn your Bibles over there just a moment to 2 Chronicles chapter 16. Asa, of course, being in the south, and we don't have a map here where you can see it, but of course, Judah's down here, Israel's here, Syria's up here. And our old friend Ben-Hadad was called upon. This is a few years before the deal with Ahab. But uh, Asa decides because, because Basha up north has gone down and he has built a fortification in the city of Ramah, which is right on the main trade route. I mean, he's just, what he's done is he's built a wall up there and he's cut them off so that they can't get anything good in or he, they can't get out. Asa's concerned about what to do concerning the situation. And so he contacts Ben-Hadad and he makes a pact with him the Syrian king, and says, I need your help with Basha. Well, now at the time, Ben-Hadad was not fighting against the kingdom of Israel, but yet Israel did not like the idea of tangling with both Judah and with Syria. And so Asa makes this deal with Basha, and much to his own demise... He sends him all kinds of gold up there, and of course it works. When, uh, when Ben-Hadad uh, is, is uh, about to send his forces down there, Basha hears about it. He withdraws himself from Ramah, and so everything's okay, isn't it? Or is it? Well, not according to Hananiah the prophet. Look at verse 7. At that time, Hananiah the seer came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, Because you have relied on the king of Syria and have not relied on the Lord your God, therefore the army of the king of Syria has escaped from your hand. Listen to the next verse. Were the Ethiopians and the Lubim not a huge army with very many chariots and horsemen, Yet because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the earth, the whole earth, to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. In this you have done foolishly. Therefore from now on you shall have wars. Asa could have said, I thought I already had wars. Not like you're going to have. 
Asa could have been walk, asking God about it all the time. In fact, the next few verses show that he really didn't learn because it says that when he, in his old age, he got sick and he dis- developed a disease in his feet and ultimately died as a result of it. But the Bible says that rather than going to the all-knowing and all-seeing and all-healing God concerning his infirmity, he went to his physicians. Some people just never learn. We look at old Asa and we say, man, what, what a crazy fella. But is he really that crazy Isn't he a lot like us? When we go through our temptations and our hardships and our frustrations and our pains and our sorrows and it just seems like the last thing we think to do is to talk to God about it. Oh, yes, God. Well, you see, God is there for a last resort. Is that what God intends? Certainly not. It's so hard for us to learn because we recognize it's something we have to continue to learn. We have to continue to learn that God sees everything and his omnipresence and his omniscience are things that are meant to be aids to us in time of plenty and in time of sorrow. We have a God who cares for us and watches us and provides for us and wants to do obviously wonderful things for us. But yet so soon we forget. One of Job's friends, Elihu, had this to say. He does not withdraw his eyes from the righteous. But they are on the thrones with kings. For he has seated seated them forever and they are exalted. Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2 that we've been made priests. It's like by our being able to see the all-seeing God for what he really is, we come to recognize that God has taken us in our lowly estate and he has elevated us into a level of significance. A level of greatness. A level of superiority over the sinners of this world. We need to be in love with the idea that God sees what's going on. We need to be friends with the idea and be filled with wonderment and joy at the idea that God is seeing what's happening and that He can help us to face whatever is before us. He's a God who cares. The psalmist said, Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear Him. On those who hope in His mercy. And we do hope in His mercy, do we not? Do we not hope that He will be there to help us, to provide for us? Yesterday, Brother David did an outstanding job pointing out to us concerning the problems that we have with our children And I'm telling you, when they get to that age, when they're out and about and going on their own, it never never is more plain and never is more true to the heart of a parent than to understand that there is an all-seeing eye of God that watches every step they make, wherever they are, whatever they're facing whatever hardship they're having to deal with. Oh, it's so hard when you're on the phone with a child that's hundreds of miles, perhaps thousands of miles away, and they're dealing with heartache. And you're wanting to say those words that would give them cheer, that would help them through their issues and their hardships of life. I tell you this morning, there are no greater words that you can encourage your children with 
than to make them understand and to see that there is an all-seeing God watching over every, every move they make. And we won't ever be able to give that kind of advice until we recognize that he's seeing us too. The occasion is, you're in the chair, the preacher is sitting behind the desk, he comes around and he puts his hands on the arms of the chair and he looks you straight in the eyes and he says, where is God? Thank you.